Good afternoon. We have a pretty packed program, so maybe we should get going. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many coming out this afternoon. My name is Oliver Schmidtke, and as the director of the Center for Global Studies, I have the pleasure of welcoming you here and guiding you through this afternoon. Um, before we start off, let me acknowledge that we are the uninvited guests on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose traditional territory this university stands. And you will hear, at least in two of the presentations um, in, in, that are to become now, that there is this direct link to issues also of indigenous food sovereignty or food security. And you know that this link is something that we would like to explore this afternoon as well. When we thought about uh, planning this event for Idea Fest, we thought about how timely it would be to look at the nexus between food sovereignty, food security, and climate change. Because as I think you're all aware, uh, the climate uh, change, the, cli uh, the change of our environment will have an immediate and very severe impact on how we produce our foods, how we feed an increasing world population, and you know, we will have to react in terms of our practices uh, and also in terms of the footprint that our food production leaves in terms of its environmental impact. At the same time, you could argue that looking at food, how we relate to food, how we produce it, can be one way of engaging citizens in thinking about how we could adapt to it and fight climate change. Think about um, the, the, uh, the footprint that food production leaves on the climate, but also how looking at food sovereignty, it engages local communities and it in a way allows people to take ownership over a critical element of how we deal with, the, with this very important aspect of, uh, of our food production and in addressing climate change. What we've planned for today is to have our six esteemed panelists to address <coughs> the audience very shortly for about eight minutes. Um, and then we do something uh, we, uh, that follows the World Cafe format, which is we break up into four groups. I think some of you will have to leave. There's some students in the room here. I think it will be manageable uh, to have some of the smaller groups, uh, four discussions that will be left by the panelists. And then we will come back to the panel. And one more thing uh, in terms of logistics, this session is being filmed. so. If you don't want to be on camera or on audio, please let, um, let uh, Stephanie know she is in charge of doing this. Now, uh, let me introduce very briefly the six speakers in the order that you see them here on the podium, for starting from your left. Elizabeth Weibert, uh, immediately to my left, is a professor and historian at the University of Victoria with a focus on issues of colonialism, poverty, and gender, and how food, issues of food, production of food, food sovereignty fits into this political, cultural environment. Since 2012, um, she has been doing community-engaged research with women on a small-scale farm in South Africa. And some of you might have seen her award-winning documentary film, The Thinking Garden, that has emanated from this research. Elizabeth is now the director of the Four Stories About Food Sovereignty Project, which looks at, um, at historical and contemporary food crisis, community responses um, in indigenous communities in Canada and Colombia, refugee communities in Jordan, and rural and urban communities in South Africa, and also here in Canada. So um, speaks directly to what we want to address here today. To um, Elizabeth, Right is Jeff Korntassel, who's a writer, teacher, and father from the uh, Cherokee Nation. He's cur currently an associate professor in Indigenous Studies Department at UVic, and is also acting director of the Center for Indigenous Research and Community-Led Engagement Circle here on campus. His research and teaching interests focus on everyday acts of resurgence and the intersection between sustainability, climate justice, and community well-being. He's currently completing work on his forthcoming book on sustainable self-determination, which examines indigenous justice and gender-based resurgence. To his right is Professor Jutta Gutbelet, who teaches in the geography department and is the coordinator of the community-based research lab at UVic. 
Her research interests include participatory action, um, research, development challenges related to food security, consumption, and waste, with a specific focus on alternative developments, waste governance, and grassroots innovations around the world, with particular interest in Brazil. In 2016, she published a book, Urban Recycling, Cooperatives, Building Brazilian Communities with Rubbish. To her right is Matthew Little, who has joined uh, the University of Victoria not too long ago and is now an assistant professor in the School of Public Health and Social Policy. Um, he conducts community-based food and nutrition research uh, in India, the Philippines, and in can Canada's north. Um, on his right is Mabel Gauthier, who is a PhD student in geography and also part of the com community-based research lab um, in, in geography. Um, and uh, she's also a graduate fellow at the Center for Global Studies. Her research interests include resilience um, and human dimensions of global change, participatory approaches, youth engagement in the Arctic regions primarily. And last but not least is Zahir Chachedje. So, sorry, Bjorn, I've been practicing all night. I, I, I will get this right at some stage. Um, Zahir is a master student in geography who works in community gardens um, in Victoria to examine ways of, uh, towards an improvement of food production and sustainability. And before joining us here in Victoria, Zahir was um, a, an urban planner in Tehran uh, looking also after um, local community gardens, balcony gardens, and food productions in Tehran. So with this esteemed panel, and you can see here the intersection of food security, community engagement, um, we have now for each panelist eight minutes, and we have a very strict timekeeper. So could I ask you, Elizabeth, to come up and start us off, or do you want to speak to me? I think we decided that we will speak from here. Uh, is the, are you picking me up? It's working fine? Okay. Thank you very much, Oliver and, and panelists. Uh, I look very much forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, my task in uh, this panel, panel is to do a couple of things very briefly. First, to define food sovereignty uh, or characterize it as best I can, and then to sketch the history of the food sovereignty movement um, very briefly. So first, the definitions. Um, food sovereignty is a more robust concept, or it's at the robust end of the spectrum of the, the, the food security spectrum. I think of it as a more robust, more political concept than food security. Food sovereignty, as you can see on the board, there is uh, the right of peoples to healthy and to culturally appropriate food uh, produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. And crucially, their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. So, so food sovereignty is very concerned about the who and the how. Who produces the food? How do they produce it? Where do they produce it? The nature of that food. Uh, and crucially, the rights of people to define the nature of their own food systems, the nature of the systems by which they access and or produce food. Now, food security, by contrast, is at the more, can be at the more sort of humble or cramped end of the spectrum. Uh, it has in the past had a tendency to focus on maximizing production, um, on questions of access, but with little thought to how the food was produced, by whom it was produced, how it gets to people, so how it's distributed. So food security to, to generalize and simplify is, is at the sort of more, uh, uh, cramped and of a fuller spectrum. Um, and this uh, cramped view is well articulated in the words of, uh, of Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Agriculture, John Block, in the 1980s, who said that the idea that developing countries should feed themselves is a product of a bygone era. They should uh, just buy their food from the US, essentially. Um, so, Food security in that kind of articulation, which for a long time was a kind of dominant articulation, um, didn't have the same social and environmental concerns uh, about power and rights and uh, the health of the environment that food sovereignty would take on. Um, we inhabit what's often called the third modern global food regime, the corporate food regime. 
the two previous ones are on the board, I don't have time to speak to them. Um, this global food regime, uh, the corporate regime, emerged or came into full flower in the 1980s in the wake of worldwide economic shocks and in the midst of brutal economic adjust adjustment uh, programs that were imposed by multilateral institutions and donor nations on the global south, on the nations of the developing world or the global south. Um, and those uh, adjustment programs slashed, among many other things, government support for agriculture and for small-scale food producers in those developing nations. Uh, in Canada at that time, in the US and the global na north nations, uh, this time saw the, the consolidation or the securing of the shift to massive industrial farming. Uh, and it's no coincidence that in that decade, the 1980s, the food sovereignty movement was born. Uh, it began to emerge in the 80s in direct response to the injustices and inequities that were being spawned by this self-securing uh, corporate uh, food model. In the, in the 80s, national peasant organizations began to forge transnational solidarities among themselves, first in Latin America, among food producers, indigenous food producers as well, and uh, landless uh, food workers. Uh, at first, the movement started and, and gathered steam in Latin America, and then it spread globally. In 1993, um, these groups founded an organization called La Via Campesina, the, the peasant way or the peasant path. And this solidarity movement among food uh, producers was a direct response to the kinds of pressures and inequities that were flowing from the globalization of industrial, capital intensive, corporate dominated, neoliberal agriculture. Uh, those inequities and injustices included widespread dispossession of small-scale farmers' lands. Inequities included the fact that, well, up to 70% of uh, the, the food consumed in the world, then and still today, is produced by small-scale producers. And that st precise statistic is disputed or debated, but a very large a majority of the world's food that's consumed is produced by small-scale producers despite the fact that up to 70% of the producers uh, and a majority of those producers, women, um, were producing the food that fed the world, the enormous profits from the global food system went to the corporations, the corporations that were in charge of food processing and food transportation and uh, manufacturing and the seed with which so much food was grown. Um, so the... Uh, Food Sovereignty Movement and then the umbrella organization, La Via Campesina, emerged in that context of burgeoning inequities and injustices. In 2007, the global spread of the Food Sovereignty Movement became clear when more than 500 organizations from more than 80 countries were represented uh, at a big uh, Food Sovereignty Conference in Mali in West Africa where they committed themselves to the ideals of food sovereignty. Uh, and those, many of those ideals, not the entire project, but many of those ideals are noted here on the board. So food sovereignty in the language of the Nyeleni Declaration, which came out of that 2007 meeting, food sovereignty foregrounds the aspirations and needs of those who produce, distribute, and con consume food rather than the aspirations of markets and corporations. Uh, food sovereignty defends <coughs> the interests and the inclusion of the next generation. It's a forward-thinking project. It prioritizes local, regional, and national economies and markets over global markets and export-oriented uh, agriculture. It prioritizes environmental, social, and economic sustainability in ways that corporate agriculture has not been famous for. It ensures uh, that the rights to use and manage lands and waters and seeds and biodiversity are in the hands of those who produce foods. Uh, and it implies a whole set of social relations that are not oppressive. Um, so clearly food sovereignty is a political project. It's concerned about human rights and social justice. And increasingly today, we hear food sovereignty discussed in tandem with climate justice. Um, 
And the most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, um, reminds us of, helps us to draw the direct connection between uh, food production and the climate crisis. It reminds us that agriculture produces, in its statistic, 25% of greenhouse gases. Uh, and it calls for urgent action to address the land degradation that results from the unsustainable food production activities that we've been engaging in now for several decades. Um, many co commentators call the IPCC's 25% figure, 25% of greenhouse gases coming from, uh, coming from uh, agriculture, many commentators call that figure too low. If we factor in the miraculous carbon sequestering capacity that's lost when we cut down Amazon forests to grow, to raise cattle, for instance. And if we factor in the emissions produced by transporting strawberries around the world uh, in the middle of winter so that consumers can eat them in, out of season, uh, and so on, and many of the factors that Yuta and others will speak to, then the carbon footprint of agriculture is very much higher. That's the food climate nexus that we want to speak to here today. So now we'll hear from colleagues about the challenges and also some of the inspiring actions that they see on the ground in the communities where they research. Osio Nigata, Jeff Ganoalito Cortesso, Dagwadoa, Shalagi, Yetli, Aguena Sahi, Echoda Kalski Koi. So my name is Jeff Cortesso, I'm from Cherokee Nation. And it's an honor to be here on the unceded lands of the Lekwungen and Wiyungup and uh, Los Angeles peoples. Uh, so I always come back to uh, Cherokee word uh, or Cherokee words when thinking about these these struggles. And so one word that came to mind, one word that was taught to me was nigaya isoi. Uh, despite hardships, despite struggles, even if we lose someone, we carry on, we persist. And so in that sense, we think of our life ways as indigenous peoples, as part of our territories of life, right? These are territories of life that have sustained us for generations, and these are part of our relational responsibility. So just as we have uh, asserted our self-determining authority uh, regarding what is appropriate to grow, we also assert uh, that ability to be in relationship with those plants, with those, with those animals. Um, and we have certain protocols, we have certain treaties, if you will, uh, to, to follow. Uh, Wenola LaDuc and uh, her family is a little less generous when thinking about these things. Uh, one of the things that she shared is a statement that her dad used to say to her, he said, if you can't grow corn, don't talk to me about sovereignty. And it's a pretty, uh, a pretty stark comment, especially if you're living in an urban area, if you don't have access to your land. Uh, but it really, I think, drives home the point that when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about food security, food sovereignty, uh, and even more importantly, when we're talking about climate change, we're also talking about a colonial problem. We're talking about colonial encroachment onto our territories, this lack of, of, of our ability to, uh, in a sense, have these relationships with the plants, with the animals, in order to engage in that food sovereignty, engage in those spiritual aspects uh, that promote and nurture our health and well-being. When I uh, went to a, a, uh, an aquarium recently, uh, this was one of the signs that said 70% more food by 2050. And it was just sheer volume, right? It was, uh, we can do it this way on the ocean, right? We can do it in all sorts of different ways, uh, but it's sheer volume and not getting at the actual distribution of that food or how that food was grown or whether that food is appropriate, right, to these uh, to indigenous nations, to these communities, and on whose land is it grown, right? And so it's not just about volume, uh, it's about those relationships that we have. Uh, to quote Enrique Salmon, uh, he talks about, we don't even know the landscapes of the people that we're eating, right? Of the, we don't know the people's landscapes that we're eating. Uh, the other side of this is you see the, uh, a, a picture of the Australian fires, and you think about the management of the land via um, controlled burns, right, and how that's been criminalized. So uh, when I talk about this as a colonial problem, the actions of land defenders, the actions of people 
engaging in land-based activities that have sustained them for generations are often criminalized. Whether it's Cheryl Bryce, we had a great panel with Cheryl and Bianca and others last night uh, talking about how she's been run out of countless uh, parks and countless places that her family has been managing for generations, managing Camas or Quetlaw. The other uh, lower picture is from Helsing First Nation. I don't know if you remember the big oil spill that happened there in 2016, but in response, the Helsing First Nation basically said uh, and asserted that this is a violation of Helsing law. So part of the uh, part of the framing of food sovereignty from an indigenous standpoint is uh, understanding the indigenous laws of that land and how they reflect those relationships that come out of those relationships. This is Kivalina, uh, and there are lots of Kivalinas, I think, throughout the world, but Kivalina is a small island uh, just 80 miles north of the Arctic, and it has about 382 people in that community. It's a whaling community. Uh, and in all likelihood, in 25 years, Kivalina will be underwater, right? And so there are several funds that have been put in place to relocate peoples from their territory. Uh, but you begin to think of the complications, this nexus between climate justice and food sovereignty uh, that comes and hits uh, people especially hard in places like Kivalina, uh, where they're reliant uh, in some cases on food that's flown in, uh, not too unlike Victoria, right, uh, food that is shipped in, right? And so you begin to think of that dependency, you think about the food prices, and how it's, uh, it becomes cost prohibitive to even hunt uh, because of the prices of gas and the prices of other things to engage in those activities. And you have, in a sense, that spiral uh, of climate injustice. Winona LaDuke, I mentioned her earlier, I should give a more, uh, a more positive quote. Uh, food sovereignty is an affirmation of who we are. And I think it's really important to point out that Food sovereignty has a spiritual element to it. Uh, so when you think of the first salmon ceremony here on the West Coast, right, that's about honoring those relationships. It's also about, uh, in, that, in, in certain communities, mimicking the actions of the salmon and taking that time to honor that, uh, that salmon, that first salmon that's taken. Uh, in the meantime, salmon are going by, right, going by in the, in the river. And so it's not conservation in a, in a Western construct, it's actually engaging in these deeper relationships so the salmon will return, so that this will be an ongoing relationship and following those protocols. And I like to focus on um, uh, what Leanne Simpson calls the ecologies of intimacy, right? These are the really uh, seemingly small things that happen in our everyday lives. Uh, these are the ways that we engage in our languages, the ways we engage in our ceremonial life, the way we engage in land-based practices uh, that are often not seen, uh, they're often not acknowledged, but they're significant. These are the things, these are the conversations we literally have around the kitchen table uh, that in a sense teach us and teach other peoples how to engage in these meaningful relationships. This is a picture of my daughter she would be horrified if she knew I was posting this. Uh, but she's picking up a doxy or a turtle. Uh, this is a snapping turtle too, so that's the proper way to hold a snapping turtle closer to the back. Uh, but on the surface, this looks like we're just helping a turtle across the road. In a deeper sense, doxy or turtles are important parts of our relations. Uh, the women in our ceremonies use them, they attach them to their ankles, and they shake shells and they honor that doxy. Uh, when you don't have turtles, uh, which oftentimes there's a shortage, uh, you use tin cans. And so my daughter has a set of tin cans, uh, which she shakes shells, right? So we adapt. We adapt to those changes. We adapt to those, um, those shortages at times, but we persist. Nigaya iso i. So I'll close there. Why don't Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, be part of this uh, panel. So my presentation will be focusing on the nexus uh, between food sovereignty and, and waste. 
um, globally nearly one third of the food we produce for human consumption is actually lost, um, which means 1.3 billion tons of food is lost every year. And this has very serious implications as an ecological footprint, but also as a social footprint. Uh, furthermore, um, food packaging, particularly packaging uses, um, <coughs> plastic packaging uses up a lot of resources and contaminates the environment, um, generating a very high ecological footprint. And I will be talking about more specifically uh, in a minute. So both these uh, central challenges are <clears throat> both are central challenges to, to human health and the environment. Uh, we've already heard um, that food sovereignty, it is about health uh, and healthy food, to, to produce healthy food, um, and that means also um, that, yeah, that we have the right to healthy food. But we have to question how healthy is actually our food nowadays. More and more, particularly in urban environments, uh, we're eating highly processed food, food affected by contaminants in the environment, for example, air and water contamination, but also from agricultural practices using pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, etc. And also food and beverages are nowadays very highly packaged in, in plastic. Um, so thus we're making our food unhealthy and we're contaminating the environment through food uh, production and, and through discarding the packaging. So food packaging um, is nowadays, it is single use for, for quick disposable um, and to provide a convenient lifestyle. But uh, plastics are so widespread uh, nowadays um, and, and um, it, it also is like a huge um, industry behind the, the production of, of plastic uh, products. See, alone in Canada, it, uh, it's 25 billion per year, which is uh, manufactured in terms of plastic, plastic products, which accounts to 5% of all sales uh, in the manufacturing <coughs> sector in, in Canada. But it also means, of course, a lot of employment. It's 93,000 people um, across the country in 1,932 establishments uh, involved in producing plastic, uh, plastic products. Uh, and yet, in, in Canada, as in most other countries as well, um, the, the plastics economy is a mostly linear <coughs> economy, which basically means that most of that plastic is not even recycled. In Canada, we recycle 9% of plastic waste. Most of it, uh, most of the rest is actually landfilled, and 1% uh, litters our environment. So there, there are really serious health implications uh, related to plastic, and we all have heard about the microplastics and the nanoplastics, which are uh, migrating into our food uh, under certain conditions, and um, and once it is in our food chain, these microplastics, they can cause uh, very serious health implications, particularly affecting the digestive system, um, the digestive system's immune response. Um, and um, so it could be, there is a lot of uncertainty still, but um, these plastics, microplastics, they could aid the transmission of toxic chemicals um, and pathogens. So microplastics are actually studied now as, as endocrine disruptors, which means that um, all chemicals that can interfere with the endocrine system and also the hormonal system um, um, as certain doses. And these disruptions, they can cause cancer tumors, uh, birth defects and other development uh, disorders. So um, there, I think what, what is so concerning to me is knowing that there is so many different chemicals in our environment. We're speaking now about 80,000 different chemicals in use. And alone for the plastic industry, there is 900 chemicals which are associated with the packaging and approximately 
3,400 more different chemicals might be also used in food packaging all around the world. And so knowing about <coughs> these health implications, um, I think it is a serious concern for us to, to think about alternatives in terms of how we package our food um, and how we store our food as well. <coughs> But we still, this is like very current research. We know very little about the environmental and health implications of these materials, particularly when they are breaking down. But scientists are very sure about that they are breaking down, that plastics are not stable materials. So we're actually contributing to making our food unhealthy and we're contaminating <coughs> our environment uh, through the use of plastic packaging. Um, um, so that is one concern, the microplastics in the uh, um, packaging. But there is another concern, which I also would like to address in my few minutes which I have left, which is related to food waste. Uh, food waste is, has serious environmental implications. And um, food waste, um, and food is wasted for different reasons. Um, it, um, it, sometimes because it is considered not up to the consumer standards or best before dates have passed, and so large quantities of edible food are uh, unused or left over and discarded from household kitchens and, and feeding establishments. What that comes to is uh, that food waste is is not just a terrible misuse of natural resources, but it also creates a huge carbon footprint. And here on the image we see on the right side um, the contribution to, of uh, consumption, of household consumption to the um, carbon footprint, um, which Elizabeth has already um, uh, indicated at the beginning of, of the talk. So the highest loss of food and consequently the highest carbon footprint occur, occurs actually at the consumption level, at the household level, at the restaurants and, and eateries. Um, and there is also to be noted that globally um, it is actually the rich countries that are wasting significant, significantly more food than the rest of the world. The global average per capita food waste footprint on climate in high-income countries is more than double that of low-income countries and more than four times of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So we in the Global North, we have um, high responsibility to take um, on in this, this issue. Um, so, but the question is why, since we know that it's at the household level, uh, most food is, um, is wasted, um, we're looking, there's two explanations which um, contribute to um, explaining why there, there is so much food waste. The first one um, goes on to understandings and perceptions of food waste. And the second one on food-related household practices in, um, and routines. So to finalize, um, so to address the food health concerns related to plastic packaging of food, a radical shift away from single-use plastic to eco-efficient substitutes has to happen. And also, we need to create appropriate incentives to reduce uh, food wastage through regulations, policies, shifting social norms, etc. And finally, we need to make more informed decisions in our dietary choices about the kind of food to consume and also the kind of packaging um, we, we support and agree to. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Little. Uh, I'm a, a new assistant professor here in the School of Public Health and Social Policy. <clears throat> and I want to transport everyone right now to the Canadian North, to Inuit Nunangat, which means Inuit homeland, which is this vast swath of land in the Canadian Arctic region that's home to about 40,000 Inuit. Uh, 
And uh, while I'm not Inuit myself, and nor am I Indigenous, I've been working with communities across the, the uh, Canadian Arctic for the last three or four years now to try to preserve and, and revitalize and try and figure out ways to do that, um, to preserve and revitalize the, the traditional food systems uh, of the North. And this, these systems depend on what are called country foods locally, um, which include a, a variety of animals uh, and berries and things like that, that, uh, that are really crucially important to food security, to health, and I mean health <clears throat> in the most holistic sense, as well as relationships to land and to others. We know that food insecurity is an enormous issue across the Canadian North. 70% of households in Nunavut specifically are food insecure. That means that 70% of families have difficulty actually reaching their needs when it comes to food. <clears throat> this is in comparison to 8% of the general population of Canada. And that 70% includes a large proportion of families that are severely food insecure, that have difficulty accessing food every <coughs> single day. And we know that a large reason for this is the high retail food prices. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. Food prices in Nunavut and across the Canadian North are 150 to 300 percent higher than they are in, in the Canadian South. This is despite the fact that foods and food prices are fairly heavily subsidized across the North. <clears throat> but what really we're realizing and Inuit communities are recognizing increasingly is the key to uh, addressing food insecurity as an issue is the country food system. There's an abundance of wildlife, of traditional knowledge to harvest that wildlife and those, those, uh, those land um, berries and things like that that exist in the north. And we're recognizing that while country food currently comprises only about 20% of the total dietary intake across the north, this could increase and it could actually be used to address food insecurity and address the issue of really inaccessible and unaffordable uh, market foods. So country foods are crucial. Um, we know that not only do they, could they potentially have an impact on increasing food insecurity and reducing the incidence of things like obesity and type 2 diabetes and nutritional deficiencies which are increasing drastically across the North, but they also have an important uh, spiritual and emotional and relational component to them as well, just as Jeff was talking about. Um, these, this country food system and, and, and the activities, the harvest, the sharing, and the preparation of different country food preparations really has the potential to improve the kind of social connectivity and spiritual and emotional health in addition to food security and, um, and physical health as well. But in addition to all of the barriers that have been erected over the last hundred years or so to accessing country foods, so things like uh, colonial processes and political harvest management structures, things like the increasing cost of gasoline, as, guess, as Jeff mentioned, and, uh, the increasing inaccessibility of country, migra migrating country food populations due to the fact that Inuit are no longer migratory themselves. There's another enormous uh, issue and a pillar of uh, one of the kind of main issues in, in, uh, when it comes to accessing country foods and the safety of those foods in the north, and that is environmental contaminants, just as Jutta mentioned. So environmental contaminants are reaching very, very high levels in many country foods across the north. These are things like persistent organic pollutants, including polychlorobisphenols, organochlorines like DDT, as well as heavy metals like mercury and lead and cadmium. And uh, we know that these compounds are associated with uh, significant health implications. So things like neurodevelopmental uh, challenges and attention deficit disorders and uh, even things like cardiometabolic conditions are associated with consumption of these things. And we know that it was discovered in around the 1980s and early 90s that Inuit populations actually have very, very high body burdens, it's called, so levels, tissue levels of environmental contaminants due to their exposure through the country food system. And you might be wondering exactly why and how these environmental contaminants get into what per perhaps was pre previously seen as a fairly pristine ecosystem. And there's a variety of different reasons for this. First of all, we know that air and ocean currents kind of uh, force these these compounds that are emitted into our atmosphere and into our oceans to actually travel to the north and they kind of get stuck in these ocean gyres that, that circulate around the Arctic. But also we know that uh, a lot of these compounds are volatile, so they evaporate and they c condense kind of and bounce all around the world like a grasshopper. And in fact, it's called the grasshopper effect. But 
they're much less likely to evaporate and much more likely to condense at colder temperatures. So as a result, Arctic ecosystems and Arctic environments turn into a sink for these environmental contaminants. On top of that, they bioaccumulate over the span of, um, of, of animals, over the lifespan of animals, and they biomagnify up the food chain. So animals higher up uh, on the higher trophic levels of the food chain are much more concentrated when it comes to these types of contaminants. So things like beluga, polar bear, walrus, and these types of animals have very, very, very high concentrations of mercury and POPs. But this isn't just a sad story. I wanted to bring in the fact that this is actually a success story. When we talk about environmental contaminants in the North, these are things that are being actively fought against by Inuit organizations and individuals, and they're actually succeeding. So back in the 1990s, uh, Sheila Wakluche, who is um, the president of the Canadian chapter of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, and is still actively involved in this issue, she brought together a group of Inuit organizers and activists and actually petitioned the United Nations Environment Program to ratify a large-scale agreement across countries, international agreement, to, tr to try to limit the production and emission of persistent organic pollutants. And after several years of really hard work, they actually achieved this. So in 2001, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants came into, or was signed, and then in 2004, it came into effect. And then they repeated those efforts and succeeded in, in getting the Minamata Convention signed as well, which limits the emissions of global uh, mercury um, uh, worldwide and was ratified by, by um, uh, 120 countries or so. And what we have actually seen when we look at the data now in the Arctic and successive studies that have been conducted on Inuit populations show that PCBs have actually declined very substantially in the blood level, the blood and tissue of uh, Inuit populations by about 83% since the late 1980s. And this is due partially to, to the fact that country food consumption is actually declining, but a lot of this has to do, do with the fact that global uh, emissions have actually declined as a result of this, the ratification of the Stockholm Convention. And as a result, Inuit are no longer exposed to as high of levels of these things. So they're able to now have more trust in their country foods than they did uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So hopefully this is a good example of a success story of how a local uh, small group with a large voice can actually cause global uh, change and can, can change things for the better. So I wanted to leave you with that as we're going through all of these problems and problematizing kind of the issue of food sovereignty and food security and, and climate change, um, that really this is the way that things get done. Local people raising their voices and enacting global change. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. I'm happy to be on this panel. Um, Maiva Gauthier, a PhD student here in geography in the community-based research lab. And I'll share some highlights tonight about um, my research, which uh, brings me to Taktiaktak in the Northwest Territories. So, um, and more specifically, I'm using participatory video to engage the Inuvial youth in Taktiaktak around issues of climate change. And, um, and uh, Taktiaktak, for the ones, for people in this room who haven't been up north, uh, it's in the Western Arctic, uh, on the Arctic Ocean, uh, it's part of, part of the Northwest Territories. And it's part of the Inuvial um, settlement region. And um, uh, it's a uh, town, uh, a thousand people or so, mainly Inuvialit. And uh, it, <coughs> sorry, the term Taktiaktak uh, means place resembling a caribou. It was a base for oil and gas development in the 70s and 80s. And now it still remains to this day. There's those empty uh, dorms and camps that are still in town, even though uh, right now uh, there's a moratorium in place. <clears throat> but it, that, that brought a lot of many, many services in town and actually the road all the way to the Arctic Ocean in Taktiaktak. It's, it's now the only Canadian uh, Arctic village that, that's accessible uh, via road all year long. And actually, that brings a lot of tourism in town since 2017. So for a town of 900 people or so, 1,000 people, they get 15,000 people <laughs> during summer in Taktiaktak. So a lot of changes in town, for sure. Um, the economy is around the traditional whaling. Uh, Beluga is a big source of subsistence foods. 
Um, it's also uh, generally hunting and fishing, so geese, for example, and fishing different types of fish, white fish, uh, tourism, as mentioned, uh, transportation and gas. And what's interesting about the region, um, and I'm just going to skip to this slide, is uh, they, uh, they have a co-management model for the food sovereignty in this region. And it's seen as a model for, uh, say, the Eastern Arctic or for Alaska. They, they see this as a model for um, having control over their foods and how they access it and when they access it. And um, in brief, they have a joint management system that brings Inuvialuit to the table with federal and territorial governments. And if, for example, the geese are showing up earlier than usual, or um, uh, for example, um, Beluga are showing up earlier in, in a different spot than usual, they can decide on when and how to harvest. So that's a, that's a great integrated resource management uh, model for other communities across the north. Um, in terms of the climate change issue, uh, Taktiakak is very affected by the erosion, so the permafrost is melting at a very rapid pace, but combined with the extreme weather events like big storms in the summer, and less sea ice also means that when the storms hit, they hit the coast harder and, and they're not as protected uh, from the wind. <clears throat> For example, this house, um, that's only a few months apart, so I was there in June last year, for a month, and uh, so the photo to the left and the photo to the right is the same house um, in August, same summer. So uh, that house, I wonder if they have moved it yet, but there's many houses in, in Taktiakta that are now being moved further inland. And I was talking to um, the Hamlet recently and they're, they're looking at, they're seriously talking about re relocation right now. And so it's a very emotional topic and it's not easy and there's no, it's not a, uh, it's not a so solution that works for everybody. So it's a, it's a tough discussion to have. And and working with the youth in Taktiyaktak, they've been working on a video on climate change and interviewing elders and community members in town about uh, what they observe and the solutions that they think are the best for climate change solutions. Um, it also affects a lot on on uh, their roots for hunting, for example. Uh, with the permafrost shifting around and also sea ice, uh, it's also with sea ice melting um, earlier in the spring and forming later in the fall, that means less access to, um, to their fishing spot, for example. Um, so it's a question of safety, it, it's a question of life or death sometimes. Um, it's also very hard to predict the weather for them. So um, I, I heard many times that traditional knowledge they cannot trust their own traditional knowledge sometimes. So it's very hard for, uh, for say, elders passing on knowledge to younger generations. It's, it's, a big, um, it's a big change for them, and they don't know necessarily. They're very resilient, uh, but it's hard sometimes to know uh, what to do. So it means being very, very adaptable and, and take the safest route and not take any chances. So. Um, so, so yeah, and in, in, in terms of the, the waste, I know Utah talked a little bit about the food waste and, uh, and, and packaging, so that's also an issue in many, many towns in the north is, is the waste management and the waste governance around that. So a lot of uh, food is shipped up north, but recycling is very minimal and, and often they get stuck with the waste in a way. So, um, so if you have an open dump and you have plastic sitting there and it's flying around, and, and so there's different issues around plastics in the environment, and, and there's been some studies around <laughs> belugas, and they, they have found microplastics and, and plastics in all the belugas um, uh, analyzed, there were seven, and uh, they think it's coming from the Arctic cods that the belugas eat. So uh, it's present in the environment, and, and uh, actually I'm heading back up north in two weeks, and we're gonna work with the youth on a plastics story to document plastics perceptions and solutions that the community uh, think about. <clears throat> so um, ending on a positive note, I think youth leadership is an amazing piece. Uh, uh, it's something that really drives me towards this project. I, I'm working with a group of five to seven youth in Taktiaktak from 15 to 19 years old. Their climate change film was shown at the UN Climate Change Conference in Madrid last December. 
uh, and, and you know, I, I think it, it really, uh, using video as a tool, it really increased dialogue about the issue within the community, but also with policymakers in the, in the region, so locally in TAC, but also in Inuvik, and uh, also uh, at the federal level, and, and now with the UN Climate Change Conference at the global level. So they had the chance to meet other indigenous communities affected by the climate crisis uh, on a very personal level, and, and through that uh, journey, uh, they, they told me that they felt that their voices matter. And, uh, and, and I think you know, bringing more youth in the, in the policy decisions moving forward, I think it's a, great, uh, it's a great way forward and it's a great way to keep hope in, 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 uh, in these uh, big challenges. So I think that's all for me tonight, but uh, looking for, for the discussions later. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. Uh, about six months ago, I did interviews with gardeners who works in uh, community gardens in Victoria. And when I went, when I went uh, to visit a community garden located in James Bay neighborhood, I met a lady who was 65 years old. I had a nice chat with her and she shared a lot of interesting things me. And she said foods coming to Victoria from around even province and countries takes many miles and miles and miles, which resulting in an unsustainability in our world. So we need to grow more food in Victoria to have more sustainable community. So we know there are a lot of challenges, mostly policy aspect challenges in Victoria. But we need to think more and find effective ways to improve and increase uh, food production hours. So I'd like to move on to the next slide. Yeah, we had a decrease in the farmland area uh, by 842 acres, and it decreased in a uh, number of uh, food uh, farm operators by 165 from 2011 to 2016 in CRM in Victoria. So we also had uh, uh, an increase in the average age of uh, farmers and food import to Vancouver Island. On the other hand, we had a population increase in Victoria by 7% in the same period in 2011 to 2016. And in 2016, about 61% Victoria households Resulting in need of more than 13,000 parking units and more than 2,700 ground oriented dwelling in Victoria by 2041. So, from this, we understand the necessity for locally ground food through different forms of urban agriculture in Victoria. Uh, in urban agriculture projects, mostly community garden projects in Victoria, many stakeholders contribute. I brought here some of them, some, some of them which play a major role in Victoria and um, community gardens in Victoria, including city council, residents, uh, community center, city councilor, uh, schools, university, and so on. So, I conducted interview with three, with three different groups, including governmental, non-governmental, and residential. So as you can see, we need an improvement in nine major areas to improve and boost food production in Victoria. The first one is we need to improve existing uh, partnership among the stakeholders, as I mentioned in the last slide. And the next one, we need to reduce existing bureaucracy uh, procedure, meaning like uh, getting approval from city council to build a community garden in the city. Next one, we need to increase awareness among residents and interestingly among the city staff and also councillors, which were mentioned by residents mostly. And the next thing, we need provide resources and facilities for gardeners, including bench, coffee maker, uh, march, a bicycle even, 
for humans. The next thing, uh, we need a change in existing zoning bylaw and land use policies from my point of view, which is the most important existing barrier for gardeners to grow food in Victoria. The next thing is we need to allocate more funding to grow food in our city. And also, we need to improve the economic aspect of uh, community gardens in Victoria, which result in community satisfaction. Two community mapping workshops were held in two uh, neighborhoods in Victoria, including James Bay and Fernwood. This work cloud uh, show us the existing expectation and barriers from the residents' perspective. As you can see, words like uh, bench, bicycle, uh, mulch, coffee, refer to providing resources and facilities for gardeners. And the words like schools, university, workshop, meaning organizing workshop, uh, increasing awareness among the uh, students and also residents. The words like uh, Proposal refer to bureaucracy procedure, and we need to address these challenges, which mentioned a couple times uh, by uh, residents and also gardeners. So, according to uh, conducted interviews and workshop, we need to take some actions in Victoria to boost food production. Mm -hmm. I divided this, divided this uh, actions into three different levels. The first one is urban planning, urban governance, and also stakeholders. As I mentioned before, in the urban planning area, we need a change and improvement and existing land use policies and regulations, and also zoning by that. We need a zone titled urban agriculture and existing zoning by that. Also, we need to add a chapter titled urban agriculture an existing official community plan. And the next thing is one of the major problems for gardening in Victoria, land accessibility. We know land is so expensive in Victoria, but still we could study new forms of urban agriculture in Victoria and examine the possibilities. The next area is urban governance. We need uh, to reduce, as I mentioned, proposal procedure and also existing long wait list to take a plot in community gardens. The next thing is an increase um, in funding and improve me, improving multifunctional aspect of community gardens, like social aspect, by inviting people with different cultural background. The next thing is we have to organize a society, including gardeners. Gardeners need a society to share their voice by city staff, city councilor, policy director, right? And the next one, the stakeholders group. We need to improve the current uh, network among stakeholders by organizing workshop, celebrating harvest, organizing campaign. And the last thing is increasing awareness among all the stakeholders. Thank you for that. Before we move on, please join me in thanking our fabulous panel. We thought with such a big group, it might be a bit intimidating to come up with questions for our panel. It might be more interactive if we um, checked out and, and tried a different kind of way of including you in the discussion. We decided to form a few press about that. We, de we decided to form four groups around these key themes. The first one, how can we achieve zero waste? That will be um, the tail end there. Um, that will be facilitated by me and myself. So people interested in um, trying to... Oh, you didn't. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, that, that's your group. That's the first one. Sorry. Yeah. Um, the second one, what does sovereignty look like locally and globally? Um, that would be, um, this would be in this corner here. So if you're interested in the 
local global responses to food sovereignty. That will be this corner over there. Uh, what barriers stop people from acting? What actions can be done to overcome these barriers? Um, that what uh, would be is this, um, the barriers would be here in the lower part. Um, and last but not least, um, what is the, local, the role of local activism for global change? Um, that would then be, um, sorry, that would be in this court. So we will have basically the panelists facilitating the discussion. We have no takers. We have roughly 25 minutes to do this, and then we come back, report back on our discussions, and then there hopefully is still a little bit of time left for general discussions to the panelists. So uh, please feel free and uh, feel invited to join us for these not somewhat smaller, although if I look at the audience, not so small, the discussion group. So let's move into the group, smaller groups. Let's do this. Um, we start with a mic over there. Maybe you can briefly introduce which group you are and uh, take it away. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we were the visioning, or what does uh, food sovereignty look like locally and globally? And I would say we focus primarily on the local when it comes to, to that question specifically. Um, primarily because we had some expertise in the group uh, who had experience either farming locally, which is great, or um, with community food programs. So a lot of our discussion revolved around those community food programs and, and, and different um, kind of leverage points, I guess, for action within those programs. Um, so we discussed how important education is, um, whether or not cooking classes and, and things like this could be made more widely available uh, to educate consumers on their food choices and on how to prepare uh, locally produced food or food that kind of falls within their own kind of like personal view of, of food sovereignty. Um, we talked about uh, how crucial young farmers are and how challenging it is to be a young farmer these days. Um, land is expensive, it's pushing farmers further and further out from urban areas, um, and land security is an issue because um, you know, often young people cannot afford to purchase their own farmland, so as a result, they're at the mercy of, of landholders and, uh, and, and, and renting farms. <coughs> Um, but it's really crucial that, that young people are involved in farming because they're essentially the future of farming and those skills need to be passed on if we're going to establish a, a system of food sovereignty that often means localized, very localized food production. Um, the initial comment that kind of kicked us all off was that food, a very simple comment that food sovereignty looks like less trucks on the ferries. Um, so I thought that was an interesting one. Uh, technology is, is really important. I think moving from large-scale farms, and, and usually when we talk about food sovereignty, we talk about moving away from a corporate model of farming. Um, well, corporate models of farming have the advantage of, um, of mass-produced kind of technology and uh, those you know, systems kind of behind them. And so obviously small-scale farming requires that initial input and, of research and of technology in order to um, actually be successful, be profitable, and to bring costs down as well for the consumers to make sure that uh, food sovereignty is, is a concept and a value system uh, that individuals, regardless of their socioeconomic status, can actually achieve. Um, I think that's, that's essentially, you know, we talked a lot about different types of community f food programs like um, land sharing programs or land matching programs, gleaning programs, um, you know, programs that, that better use the land that exists here in Victoria and on the island, um, but also links people who want to either learn or develop skills or be a part of the food sovereignty movement to those facilities and programs and, and land and teachers and mentors and all those kinds of things that are really necessary to establish a system that, uh, that is uh, fully, you know, that can be considered within the food sovereignty kind of value system. So I think I'll leave it there, probably that was, uh, that was about it, but feel free to come and check out our, our notes. I got elected to present this. Um, we were talking about barriers to um, that stop people from taking action, and uh, 
a lot of the uh, things that you talked about with food sovereignty, uh, we talked about as well. Um, we talked about uh, climate anxiety as being a big barrier that uh, people just get too anxious and um, just want to shut down and not think about stuff. So we thought that food would be um, an easier thing to think about because we face that every day. Um, we thought education was a really uh, big element in this and that seemed to run through a lot of what we talked about as well. Um, uh, things like um, getting people to really understand what is sustainable um, and seasonal, seasonal uh, food production. So for example, if you think you're saving the planet by going vegan, then where are you getting your coconuts and your cashews from, for example? Um, and then um, there are uh, legis a lot of legislative barriers um, that are um, stopping us from changing things. Uh, for example, uh, to change changes to urban agriculture. Um, we've got it. Let's see something more. Education on uh, food production and uh, food preparation um, would be really valuable. Um, and barriers like time kept coming up because people are so busy and um, <clears throat> there is a lack of knowledge in how to prepare food, which does take time. Um, Another barrier was um, location and access to land because of new developments. Um, people living in, in little shoe boxes um, don't have anywhere to grow their food or really understand how to go about doing that. Um, we need more organizations and political awareness of how the system works. And um, then there's cost and access to food that came up a lot as well. Um, anything I jumped over here that that's it then. Okay, um, so my group's question was what is the role of local activism for global change? And what we really, really saw this coming down to is a question of, you know, how do you sort of descale the system that we have in place? And what barriers exist right now that are stopping us from doing that? Um, so one of the things that we talked about was we need to really reevaluate how people are using their time. And especially in a city like Victoria where, you know, you need to work 12 hours a day to afford living, you know, what role does policies such as minimum income um, have in making, uh, you know, farming more at the local level possible? Um, so we also talked about, you know, at the local level of government, what are the challenges to um, creating policies and bylaws? that allow for this to happen. Um, and we talked about how there's, in a lot of uh, local governments, a lack of full-time positions at the city level um, just focused on these issues. Uh, expanding on that, we pointed out that local governments tend to have this nature of reactive, not proactive movement. So, you know, when something goes awry, we're fat, quicker to respond, but we want to see more of those positive bylaws and positive, positive policies uh, really coming through. Um, and one thing that was really present in our discussions was this excitement about the possibility of um, local farming in Victoria and especially looking at, you know, the amount of green space on our front lawns and the environment that we're in. And then the question came up of, well, what organizations are in place right now that really support that? And the, it was hard to get a clear answer on that. You know, some have come and gone, but nothing really consistent. So that in itself, we talk about within a, a group of people that are, you know, fairly knowledgeable about the issue, you know, why is it not that we're able to list a bunch of names of organizations off the top of our heads? And then lastly, we sort of talked about the emerging international agreements. Um, one of them was this Buffalo Agreement um, between Canada and the United States, I think. So really focusing on the role of um, international agreements in kind of fostering a different level of trade and communication. That's all from us. Hello, so uh, our group was focusing on trying to come up with ways to, uh, to achieve zero uh, waste, which is probably not an easy, uh, easy challenge. And then I'm just going to go through some bullet points there. So reduce packaging as we basically separate the waste in terms of the packaging as well as the food. So uh, sticker policy, bio, uh, biodegradable packaging, and some alternative ways that uh, you know industries could come up with. And uh, on the other hand, stop throwing out good food 
which is also not, not easy. Uh, thinking through what the packaging uh, is basically designed for and, uh, and created for. Um, so that's also an important way of, uh, of just making sure that the packaging is, is quite minimalist and, and it, it does its job, but it's not necessarily creating extra materials and extra, extra waste there. Uh, food accessibility as, as uh, food islands there in brackets and, and uh, which, which means that a lot of people is, uh, is not able or not, are not able to access food sources the same way uh, as others and perhaps the distance is a challenge and, and uh, public transit and, and so on. Um, we were trying to uh, think of, of any uh, individual cities or places that have already uh, basically um, achieved zero waste or kind of close to zero waste as, as role models and, and perhaps those would be those would be places to, to look for, uh, look for and uh, and then uh, copy their ways of, of, of handling this, this topic uh, by we also mentioned that buying direct often costs more which is is really sad if we think of the industrial ways of, of food production that uh, that simply in, in producing such volumes that it reduces the cost uh, so that also can be a huge barrier and, uh, and creating, of course, more packaging and more, more food waste. Aesthetics, that a lot of the grocery stores would reject, uh, you know, food that is not aesthetically pleasing. So that's already, you know, coming from the source. It's not actually even making it to the uh, grocery stores. Uh, incentives for businesses to, uh, to come up with different ways of packaging and, and uh, more alternative, alternative ways, working towards, of course, or working with the government and, uh, and consumers at all levels and, and coming up with, with um, ways to, to uh, reduce waste. Um, regulations there um, make producers responsible for, for actually taking up, the, uh, taking up their own waste. So if they, if they use a lot of packaging, then producers should be responsible to to uh, take those waste back. And in a lot of stores, we see that already, that thrifties would just talk to my head and remember that they take back a lot of packaging, but I'm not sure if they would be happy if anyone just walks in with a whole bunch of <laughs> food packaging. Um, economic growth is a big factor. Of course, a lot of, the, a lot of the packaging and a lot of the sort of food comes from uh, areas and, and the incentives to, to produce or sort of consume more uh, just to keep the economy growing and, and going strong. And then we discussed some uh, issues around best before dates and how that contributes to, to uh, uh, food waste and how that could be changed. And also uh, we noted that perhaps we need to come up with an award or many more awards to uh, people that can reduce their food waste to, to zero or save the most amount of money. I think that's, that pretty much wraps it up unless I forgot something else. Thank you very much. Could I ask the panelists to come up here for a very last round of questions and then we wrap things up? But thank you very much for participating in these small rounds of discussions. It's great to hear your insight. Hi, I'm just uh, jumping in to take the opportunity to say something that I've been wanting to say. Kathleen Gibson, I live here in Lekwungen territory. I just wanted to make sure that people know there's a national organization as a place for conversation about food sovereignty, Food Secure Canada, Réseau pour une alimentation durable, and it has a document called a People's Food Policy for Canada that was based on the Neolini principles. You can find it online. And if you follow what Food Secure Canada is doing, you can participate in a national level of this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. And that seemed to have been one of the issues that we brought up in our small discussions. You know, make things accessible. You know, lower the barrier to people getting engaged in these forms of local action, gardening, changing their consumption patterns, and so forth. So, maybe I first go um, to you. Is there any questions um, that oh, sorry, these are the groups? Here we go. Sorry, coming towards the end. Anything that you would like to or um, suggestions that you haven't been able to share so far that you would like to invite the panel to reflect on or respond to. <coughs> if not, then we go maybe for. Oh, sorry, very bad. Yeah. Um, one, wait one second for the mic, please. 
Uh, what is the role of vertical farming in food sovereignty going forward uh, on our island and in Canada in general? Okay. Vertical uh, farming. Anyone in that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a vertical farming specialist, but I do look into those kinds of um, very sustainable technologies on a regular basis. Um, vertical farming, rooftop farming, hydroponics, and so on, on very simple hydroponics on roofs. Um, I think they're essential to, uh, to intensifying what we can grow in urban spaces in particular. Um, and in, we've seen vertical farming practices in urban spaces like um, the largest slum in Nairobi, Kenya, for instance. Very successful vertical farming on a, in a, very inexpensively. Um, uh, sort of burlap sacks hanging on the outside of a of a, of a small home um, and food pockets in that in that sack. So a very low low tech version of vertical farming, crucially important to the nutrition and food security of the people living in that slum. Um, and here in Victoria, there 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 is a farms that are doing that in the urban setting. So I think those kinds of innovative technologies are a vital part of our food future, for sure. Thank you for that. Did you want to offer something about vertical farming? Not particularly. Um, but my question was then, does vertical farming scale, or is it a niche market for growing herbs and microgreens? Or well, can, it, can it actually make a massive impact on uh, like a world agricultural uh, component, or is it is it small scale? I'd say it's probably medium scale. I've heard, read, I haven't seen it in action in Nairobi, but I've read that it's made a, a very positive impact on the daily lives and daily, you know, food um, availability of those communities, um, and it catches on like crazy. So three women in a row are growing vegetables, including potatoes, in these sacks, uh, and then their neighbors want to do the same. Um, so I would, I would have thought it's at the medium scale, um, and we have to operate at all scales, but that's a crucially important technology among many, it seems to me. Any other question, please? Uh, I'm just going to add to that. I mean, perhaps, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> we have half the Sorry, um, perhaps that needs to go like further to the design level on new um, residential towers, right? Like, I mean, the light, natural light can be directed through mirrors down through like a, almost a corridor system that goes through the floors and then, you know, perhaps each floor could have a, a community garden that, you know, perhaps feeds the people that live on that floor, or at least contributes to their, their, their food needs in, in some way. Um, balconies are a good idea, right? So like you mentioned, that's all I have to say, thank you. In our group, people talked about the need for um, thinking at new scales, and so the scale at which we can grow in the urban setting, it's very different than the big farms of the countryside, but it's a crucial scale for us to maximize our, our opportunities. And one of the things that came out, and this is the group Jeff was involved with, is, you know, food sovereignty is about changing relationships profoundly between people and place, people and the land, people and history, people and each other. And, and it's way beyond the technologies of how to produce more food. It's about a total transformation of relationship. Yeah. That almost sounded like a great last word, but I think we, we still have time for, if there are any last reflections, I don't want to put you on the spot, you don't have to, but if you would like to share some uh, concluding remarks, you know, the moment. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll reflect on that briefly. Um, I was thinking one of the things that came up in our group is even the rights of nature and uh, the Fanganui River, right, which was given international or legal personhood, right, in, in New Zealand or Aotearoa, and how that's become uh, kind of a movement to hold people to account to, um, to the protection of these places, but also to help co-manage these places and extend those rights beyond personhood, right? Beyond just uh, communities or groups. So um, yeah, there's a lot to reflect on there. I think those those relational responsibilities kind of take us beyond the acknowledgement, the land acknowledgement process, and that's kind of what I'm interested in these days is 
what are we what are we doing if we're acknowledging that we're on unceded territories and on someone else's territory? What does that mean in terms of our responsibility, our our own uh, kind of accountability for that? And so the things that came up last night were around um, getting involved in terms of like the community tool shed, like pulling invasives on on the land and, and things like that. So there's a lot to reflect on there. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, um, I would like to, as a final reflection, like to point towards something we also talked in our group, uh, which is the concept of sufficiency, particularly in the context of waste and food waste, and the impacts waste has on the environment, and as we heard, also can have on our health. So, I mean, sufficiency is a very key concept in terms of making us aware as to how many resources do we actually need how much consumption do we actually have to do? And I think it's up to everyone individually to, to question and to maybe scale down and realizing that less is actually more. I just want to add one more thing about the question you asked. Uh, about the vertical uh, farming, there are many forms of urban agriculture that can be examined in Victoria, but we don't forget what we're looking for by gardening in city. Yes, we grow food to eat fresh, but we don't forget the main uh, goal is improving the sustainability of the system, right? So I think ground level, like community garden project, would be more effective in terms of social aspect, as an example, not vertical. Yes, there are a lot of massive uh, vertical farming, like Singapore, Milan, Italy, but in Victoria, based on the uh, interviews I conducted and collected data, ground level farming would be more effective in terms of sustainable tipulars. I would like to, to thank our panel, but also point out that you know, this was, sure, I mean, it's a one uh, off uh, event, but really, you know, what we hope to do, and we have a fabulous group of scholars here uh, who, who tackle different aspects of food sovereignty, food security. So I really hope that. <coughs> You know, the conversation that we started here um, will continue through the networks that we've built and we also facilitated through the Center for Global Studies. So I would like to thank you for this and also a big shout out to Jody Walsh from the Center for Global Studies who in the spirit of tonight's theme have decided you know, that our thank you is homemade from Nola. <laughs> so, so that is uh, uh, a, 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 a very appropriate gift and a sign of appreciation for uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how happy your family was to see you. <laughs> uh, but you might find more inspiration in homemade granola uh, to go forward. So thank you very much for sticking with us and sharing this uh, this format. And uh, again, great thank you to all of you on the panel.